Uh, welcome back to the second half of session six, World Revolutions. Today we're looking at Mexico. Before we continue and look at the actual revolution, let's go back for a moment and just summarize some of the key points from the historical survey that we did of Mexico in the first half. Here are a series of points that come out of that historical background that are important in understanding the revolution, important to understand how these actors interacted during earlier centuries, particularly the 19th century, and some of the other forces that played a role in shaping Mexico down to the time of the regime of Porfirio Diaz. First of all, we find that peasant rebellions are a common feature of Mexico's history, both in the colonial and national periods. And certainly by the 19th century, uh, the conflict is essentially one between capitalism, between the large landowners who want to create important commercial estates, and the communalism of Indian villages. In other words, the effort of villagers to maintain uh, a system uh, in which communal lands were important, in which the idea of limiting the distances between rich and poor was significant, and in which, in general, uh, land management uh, was a community activity as much as it was an individual activity. This stress can be seen all the way back into the early colonial era, but it accelerated rapidly in the 18th and 19th centuries, particularly in the 18th century as the Crown decides to move away from its policy of protecting uh, indigenous inhabitants and their lands to some degree, limiting to some degree uh, the extent to which large landowners can impose their control upon them. And again, in the 19th century, once independence occurs and liberal policies in particular begin to accelerate uh, the process of creating a market economy in the countryside of Mexico with especially deleterious effects for peasant villages. But as we will see, even the inroads made by the large landowners in earlier centuries, uh, as much as they were significant, uh, will pale in comparison to what will happen once Porfirio Diaz comes into power, meaning if this process in an earlier and slower stage caused considerable disruption, caused these rebellions in the southwest of Mexico in the 18th century and others such as that by Juan Alvarez in the middle of the 19th century, how much worse will it be when the state decides to really become aggressive, moving far beyond anything that was imagined with the Ley Lerdo uh, in the 1850s? What will happen in terms of rural unrest? Well, we can well imagine it will become far more significant under these conditions. Now, workers. Workers are another important factor. Mexico is not a highly industrialized society and still won't be highly industrialized at the time of the revolution, but they will play a significant role in the revolutionary process. And they, too, uh, have a history of rebellion. Uh, in the earlier centuries in the colonial era, rebellion that was largely uh, spontaneous in form. Uh, gatherings and demonstrations, especially against rising food prices, the tumultos. But it is also true that by the 19th century, workers are becoming more organized, the creation of unions, the attempt to create a labor federation, and workers are especially influenced by the uh, philosophy of anarchism, by the opportunity that anarchism presents of creating an alternative future for Mexico one that would look back to uh, the communal activities of peasant villages, would look back to the cooperative efforts of artisans in earlier centuries as a basis for a new social and economic order, and one which would de-emphasize uh, the power of the state, which is seen as so uh, counterproductive in the minds of workers and to some degree of peasants. And as we will see, this philosophy seems to have particular applicability in the case of Mexico because it is indeed the Mexican state which is taking the forefront in this drive to modernize. You know, a series of laws are going to be passed by the Porfirian government, by the government of Porfirio Diaz, to bring about this process of rapid modernization. So here is a state clearly that is leading the way in this process of change. And if you're opposed to it and see yourself being exploited by it, clearly you're going to want to see something done about the central government because it, in this case, is obviously at the heart 
of this effort to transform Mexico. Now, a third reality uh, that we saw with the rebellion of Juan Alvarez is that uh, provincial elites, people who were relatively well off but whose political power was largely limited uh, to local activities, that these people were often at odds with the national government. And when uh, the situation suited them, they could call upon uh, particularly the unhappiness of peasants to raise popular rebellion and counter the efforts of the national government. So maintaining the support of provincial elites is an important means of preserving national political power in Mexico. And if you fail to do this, uh, you are risking rebellion by these groups. And again, as we get into the case of Porfirio Diaz and the Porfirian age, we will see that over time, Diaz failed to maintain the support of many members of the provincial elites, particularly in northern Mexico. We will see why that happened. And as a result, he creates an important element of revolutionary unrest within Mexico. It isn't just going to be workers and peasants. As we saw in the French Revolution, for example, and indeed the English Revolution, oftentimes the unrest begins, the revolutionary force begins with challenges from people who are in the upper echelons of society and have disagreements with the leaders of the central government. And it is their efforts, as much as they don't imagine themselves creating an all-out revolution, but their attacks upon the central government which help trigger the revolutionary process. Provincial elites in Mexico are going to play a similar role in the case of the Mexican Revolution. We also saw the importance of Mexican nationalism. The French intervention in the 1860s and the struggle required to throw off the French intervention uh, helps give Mexicans a strong sense of nationhood, of the need for national sovereignty. And of course, as we saw later in talking about the Americans, the Americans have on two occasions removed substantial territories from Mexican control, first in the uh, war from Texas independence and then in the war against Mexico beginning in 1846. And Mexicans had to be acutely conscious of the dangers that they would become subordinated to Americans uh, after these enormous territorial losses. So there is again a strong sense of national identity which often evolves uh, in part not just from a sense of common identity within Mexico but from the understanding that there is an external force that threatens to dominate us in some way or other. And therefore, we have to come together as a nation in order to resist that potential for domination from the outside. Mexico is going to illustrate that pattern clearly for us, and we're going to see it time and again in other modern revolutions, that this becomes an important factor of cohesion uh, in the revolutionary process, that what we're fighting over here is not just distinctions between social and economic classes. What we're fighting about is our right to assert our national independence and our national sovereignty. And this can often become a means for distinct social classes to come together, at least on a temporary basis. It can become the basis for these kinds of revolutionary alliances that we have seen in some of the early modern revolutions, where distinct groups can come together, at least for a time in the revolution, because they have a common interest. And in this case, Mexican nationalism, the preservation of Mexican sovereignty, becomes one such factor which can help pull some of these disparate groups together for revolutionary action. And of course, Mexican nationalism is in many ways a reaction to the American factor. In part, the actual territorial losses to the United States in the first half of the 19th century. But as we will see in a later era, certainly by the uh, end of the 19th century, the United States was less concerned with actual territorial acquisitions. We talked about this when we talked about uh, the United States last time as an agent of modernity, uh, and more concerned with economic opportunities. But that in itself becomes a significant factor in the outbreak of the revolution. Even if the United States no longer has territorial ambitions that would threaten Mexico at the beginning of the 20th century, Nevertheless, the very important role that Americans will play in the transformation that Porfirio Diaz tries to bring about in Mexico means that Mexicans will come to identify not only the good that modernization might bring, but also its evil. If peasants lose land, if workers find themselves exploited, 
if members of the provincial elite should find themselves in serious competition in terms of business because of what Porfirio Diaz has done. In each of those instances, these people, as disparate as they are in their economic and social positions, and let's add the small business people, the uh, petty bourgeoisie that we talked about earlier, each of these groups has economic problems during the latter stages of the Porfirian rule. Each group is going to see the Americans as playing a substantial role in all of this. It isn't just the Mexican government that's at fault here. It's these foreigners, and especially the Americans, who are at fault for the sufferings of peasants, for workers, provincial elites, the small business people, all of them will be able to say, well, if I have problems, I have problems not just because of the Mexican government itself, but because of these foreigners, these Americans who have come here and carried out the policies of the Mexican government. So this gives them a common unifying theme, as different as they may be and as different as their interests may be in the end, and we will see them part company at a certain point in the revolutionary process. Nevertheless, they can all agree that their problems are in part with the Mexican government, but also with Americans and especially the enormous American economic presence that evolves in the, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century in Mexico. So here are some of the key factors from Mexico's history. They're going to play a role in the outbreak and process of the Mexican Revolution. After his successful revolutionary upheaval in 1876, Porfirio Diaz is as good as his word. He is going to pursue a policy of opening up Mexico to foreign investment. In the years ahead, Americans will pour $1 billion of investment into Mexico, which may sound rather trivial to us today, but remember, we're talking about 100 years ago, when a billion dollars really was a billion dollars. This was an enormous amount of investment, um, particularly for Americans to make in a foreign economy. And particularly, as we will see, because of the tremendous impact it has in Mexico itself, in terms of the amount of influence and control that the Americans are able to exercise as a result of their investments. Now, one of the logical areas for that activity to take place was in the transportation system. One of the real, very real concerns in Mexico was that a lack of adequate transportation was holding back the Mexican economy, and there was no question that that was true. Uh, at the time that Diaz takes office, Mexico only has about 600 miles of railroads uh, in the entire country. During the course of his presidency, Mexico will increase the size of that system to 14,000 miles. And here again, let's look at the map for a minute. Just as an example, here's Mexico City, and its most important port is here, Veracruz, on the Gulf of Mexico. At the time, there wasn't any real rail system to connect the capital city with the major port. And for that matter, there were no major rail systems to help promote the exports of Mexico to other parts of the world. So both here in this critical link between Mexico City and Veracruz, there were no railroads, but neither were there railroads in the northern parts of Mexico, for example, to help export products to the United States. What happens during Porfiriato Diaz's regime is that four major railroads are going to be built in a north-south direction, connecting Mexico and the United States. And here, literally, is the opening of the door to Mexico's treasures through this railroad construction. As a result of this, Americans could bring in technologies for both mining and agricultural development, and eventually the oil industry development, and even more importantly, they could export the raw materials, the resources of Mexico, directly into the U.S. economy. So the railroad system of Mexico, the very basis of its economic growth in the years ahead, is built and controlled by Americans during most of the Porfirian regime. 
near the end of the regime, its last few years, the government was going to start taking over portions of these railroads, but exactly how significantly it controlled them before the revolution is another matter. But clearly, through most of its history, most of the history of the Diaz regime, Mexico's key to transportation, its railroads, was going to be built and, and controlled by American corporations. Uh, Huntington and other key figures in American railroad building played a significant role in this whole process. And what it meant was that Mexico could now export goods far more cheaply than it ever had in the past. It could radically reduce the cost or the price of its goods on the world market, or at least in the U.S. market in most cases, because the cost of transportation alone had been dramatically reduced. So here is a key infrastructural aspect of the Mexican economy that is now going to be in American hands. Now, with that, improvement in transportation does come rapid growth in export products, particularly in mineral goods, but also in agricultural products. Mexico will see rapid rates of increase, 4 or 5 percent a year, in its exports of key raw materials, whether it's silver, copper, uh, agricultural products like wheat, etc., are going to be flowing out of Mexico at a rapid pace and into the United States and also into European economies as well. So this has a positive effect. It does lead to economic growth in Mexico. There's no question that there was great success in accelerating the pace of Mexico's economic growth in the decades after 1876. Enormous investments were being made by Americans in the railroad system. That alone was making it possible for Mexico to export products far more cheaply than ever before in the past. Now, Diaz was not going to stop with just making transportation more efficient. He also wanted to see that the production of goods in Mexico was more efficient. And again, he was going to look particularly to the Americans to help make this possible. One of the ways he would do this is through a rewriting of the mining laws of Mexico. These laws, their basis, traced all the way back to the colonial era, uh, gave the state an important role in the mining industry. Now he was going to rewrite the laws to allow both foreigners and also Mexicans uh, to invest in a far more significant way in the mining economy with the assurance that they would be able to ho hold on to these mining sites and control them for the life of the mine. Now, of course, Mexicans are welcome to develop these interests as much as Americans are, but of course, Americans have considerably more in the way of capital and technology uh, in this competitive process. And American companies will come again to dominate the mining industry of Mexico in these years. Uh, certain companies like the American Smelting and Refining Company, which is one of the largest uh, mining and refining companies in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century. Also, more specifically, the family that came to control the American smelting and refining company, the Guggenheims. And the Guggenheim brothers were a group of uh, first merchants and then uh, mining capitalists uh, who had come to play a major role in the development of mining interests in the United States, uh, particularly in Colorado. Uh, they had become world famous uh, by the end of the 19th century because they had developed mines not only in the United States but in Latin America and on into Africa. Uh, they became perhaps the largest privately held mining empire ever to exist uh, in the world. And the Guggenheims were among the American mining entrepreneurs uh, who went to Mexico uh, by the 1890s and began developing vast mining opportunities particularly in northern Mexico. And here again, let's switch back to the map for a moment. When we look at Mexico and look across these areas, particularly in northwest Mexico, okay? Cananea, for example, is one of the key mining centers, the entire state of Chihuahua down here. Here is where much of Mexico's mining wealth lies in the northern desert regions of the country. And here the Americans were pouring in capital to develop those mining interests. So we see particularly in the northern tier of Mexico is where American mining investments come to rest. Now, another important aspect of American investment would be in agriculture. Once again, Porfirio Diaz would rewrite the laws of Mexico, allowing Americans, again, 
to come in and buy up and acquire vast stretches of Mexican agricultural properties. Uh, laws that provided for uh, the survey of land, uh, where companies would come in and survey land and acquire a significant portion of the land that they surveyed. Railroad companies were also given substantial uh, tracts of land as partial payment for their construction of the railways themselves. In general, American investors were going to have an opportunity to buy up hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of acres of Mexican agricultural land. And by the way, much of it would once again be in the northern third of Mexico. Uh, the northern tier of Mexico is where the Americans would focus much of their attention because here is an opportunity to invest in agricultural production for export. And if you're investing in the northern third of the country, it's closer to the United States, closer to the U.S. market. So again, the northern part of Mexico becomes a significant site for American investment this time in agriculture. So we have, by the late 19th century, the three significant pillars upon which American economic dominance will rest in the years ahead, and that is in railroads, transportation, in mining, and in agriculture. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the effects of this investment are extremely positive for the Mexican economy. Mexico's export growth is extremely rapid in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. This is having a positive effect in terms of promoting economic growth. But at the same time, it is being done in such a way that a variety of groups within Mexico are going to be deeply antagonized by the process itself. It will be surprising in some ways when we see what some of those groups are because, well, we could understand that peasants who are losing land obviously are not going to be happy and small business people who have to compete with large American corporations aren't going to be happy. It is also groups in the elite who are also discontented with this process. One such elite family uh, was the Madero family. They were from northern Mexico. And they had both agricultural and mining interests, but were particularly noted for their mining operations, both in mining and refining of mineral products. By the late 19th century, they found themselves in stiff competition with the Guggenheims. The Guggenheim brothers had come in and bought up vast tracts of mining properties, and they had built three large smelters in the country to refine the, ec the extracts of ores that were made from those mining properties. In the process, it was clear that they could outbuy and outproduce the Madero family. They simply had far greater resources. Uh, at their command than did the Madero family. So here is a family of considerable significance, economically and politically, in the northern part of Mexico. They benefit as well from these liberalized reforms that Porfirio Diaz has created. But they also discover there's another side to this, that the door has been thrown so wide for the Americans that they're threatening to overwhelm the Mexican elite, that in the minds of Mexico's elite, or much of it, particularly the people from the northern part of Mexico, the Americans are being given unfair advantages. And they were given all kinds of tax breaks, and they didn't have to pay this tax and that tax, and had protection uh, from the Mexican government, that many in the elite, the Madero family, again, being used as an example of this, felt that this process, as much as it may be encouraging economic growth, and it was certainly good for the elite when they had these new opportunities to uh, invest in mining and buy land, nevertheless, the advantages were so striking in terms of those given to the Americans that members of the elite were growing increasingly discontented with the government in Mexico City. Over time, this problem becomes worse in part for simple political reasons. Over time, the Porfirian regime starts to ossify, starts to become old, starts to detach itself from provincial elite families like the Madero's.
In other words, there was less and less attention paid to such local power brokers by the Mexican government. More and more, Diaz is unwilling to respond to and accept input from these groups. He's very effective at maintaining himself in power, but after more than 30 years in power, you do start to lose touch. You do start to rely on a small band of advisors in Mexico City and pay less attention to the complaints and the demands for political influence that the local elites are making upon you. Diaz was very good, for example, at manipulating and moving around military leaders. So they would not develop local power bases and they would not be a significant challenge to him. But in the process, he was also neglecting the civilian political elites who wanted a greater say in how Mexico was being run. Nobody imagined that Mexico was a true democracy, because it wasn't. But nevertheless, the elites want to be heard. They want to become part of the inner circle in Mexico City. And Diaz is failing to do that. The, from the perspective of these local elites, they have two critical concerns. One is that the Americans are overwhelming them, that they will be outspent and will simply fall by the wayside because of the competitive position that the Americans have as a result of Diaz's reforms. Their second concern is a political one, that they are being kept out of the inner circle of political decision making in Mexico City. So these are concerns that they are going to voice and that will eventually drive them to directly challenge the Diaz regime. As much as it has been good for them, as much as Diaz not only has liberalized the economy in terms of making it possible for them to acquire new lands and invest in mining, and of course the railroads benefit both the Americans and uh, domestic producers, not only that, but Diaz has made it a policy to keep the peace, uh, both among peasants and workers. Peasants who rise up face inevitable attacks from the military of the Mexican government. The military will be used whenever necessary to suppress peasant unrest. And the same with workers. They faced harsh reprisals if they challenged the regime and the activities, the economic activities that were triggered by these reforms. Uh, Diaz had a rural police force known as the Rurales that were a part of this same process. And uh, it was not justice that was being meted out here, but essentially reprisals against peasants or workers who dared to challenge the system. So again, the elites benefited from this as much as the Americans did. But nevertheless, they felt that these policies were being pursued in such a way that they were operating to their disadvantage. They wanted some say in how the regime was going to function in the future. Now, small business people have similar kinds of concerns. A man like Alvaro Obregón. Obregón uh, was a chickpea farmer. Now, he wasn't just you know, a small-time you know, family farmer. He was a commercial farmer. Uh, and man of some substance, not as wealthy as the Maderos by any stretch of the imagination. He wasn't a great landowner, but a, a commercial agriculturalist by all means. But he and others like him, merchants, small shopkeepers, uh, felt that their interests were being pushed aside again to enhance the opportunities for Americans. And that, of course, when the Americans came, many of those who came were of the sort of the Guggenheims, uh, the Stillmans and others, they were big business. And how were people like Obregón to compete successfully against these huge American corporations? And indeed, American investments in agriculture are no small deal. I mean, there are some relatively small, modest uh, colonies of American settlers who are invited to Mexico. But much of what is going on is agribusiness in the modern form. Uh, modern corporations that come in and invest in huge tracts of land that want to create modern commercial haciendas, raising cattle and crops, etc. How are commercial farmers like Obregón to compete in this kind of environment when, again, the Americans seem to gain all the advantages and seem to be preferred a as a tool of development to development by domestic producers? So again, we see among small business people, and discontents. Small merchants, uh, 
yes, they benefit when the Americans come in and develop a mine. They bring new economic activity. The merchants are able to sell more goods. But then the Americans set up a company store and insist that the workers buy only at the company store. Well, now the merchant who benefited initially from boost ec boosted economic activity is suffering because he can't sell to the local workers because they have to buy at the company store. And again, that merchant feels as though he is being disadvantaged for the purpose of assisting the Americans and assisting this process. So here again, when we're talking about provincial elites, small business people, they're benefiting initially from this whole liberalization policy, but they also begin to feel as though they themselves are becoming second-class citizens within their own economy and their own society because of the advantages given to the Americans. Now, further down the ladder, the discontent of peasants is quite easy to understand because now this long contentious battle between haciendas and peasant villages has been accelerated and massive amounts of land are disappearing from peasant holdings and being transferred both to foreign corporations and also to Mexican landowners. But the peasants see their land being lost. Furthermore, as the Americans set up these modern agricultural enterprises, they're also helping to create or expand uh, wage workers as a group in Mexican agriculture. And these wage workers have their own complaints against low wages, against abusive treatment from Americans, uh, because the Americans uh, do carry strong uh, racist views about Mexicans and treat them with disdain. So in the agricultural regions, it's easy to understand that there is this growing unrest among people who have seen this centuries-long process now accelerate. And the acceleration is clearly uh, to favor commercial land holdings and hacendados and American agribusiness at the expense of the rural populations of Mexico. Out of this kind of discontent rise two of the revolution's leaders in Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa. Now, Zapata and Villa come from very different parts of Mexico. Uh, Zapata is from this area southwest of Mexico City, and he represents a mix of both uh, traditional peasants but also agricultural workers uh, who are the subject of uh, exploitation by large landowners in that region. And then Villa is from the north, and he represents a broad mix of people that include uh, ranch hands, and mine workers, uh, small landowners. Uh, these two, although both rurally based, are from strikingly different rural environments, but they have a common concern, and that is this process of modernization that Porfirio Diaz is pursuing is disadvantageous to both them and the people around them. They see their rural societies being radically altered and not to the advantage of rural peasants or workers, mine workers and others, uh, ranch hands, cowboys, they all see themselves as the victims of this process. And many of them particularly see this as both the work of the Mexican government and the Mexican elites, but also the work of the Americans. So we have a variety of groups in Mexican society, all of whom are becoming alienated uh, from this process of modernization, even though seemingly the process is working, which is true. And if we just count what is done in terms of the growth of the Mex Mexican economy, despite the fact that it would suffer some setbacks in the years just before the revolution. If you're wondering, you know, is there an endless process of growth? No, there is some setback, uh, a major recession in 1907 in particular. But overall, the fact is, if we take the 34 years of Porfirian rule and judge it as a whole, there is this dramatic growth in the economy. But it is also true that it is being done by making much of the population, particularly peasants and workers, but especially the peasant population, pay an enormous price. They are losing land. They are forced into uh, debt peonage relationships at a rate uh, never before seen. Their way of life is being destroyed. Uh, workers on farms, workers in factories 
uh, workers in mines see themselves being exploited as never before uh, and subject to labor processes that are far more rigorous than ever before. When the Americans come in and set up new mining operations, for example, they abandon the traditional and less efficient methods of mining in Mexico, uh, which are essentially the old-fashioned you know, pickaxe. You, know, you go down and you cut away with a hand tool a certain amount of uh, vein of ore and introduced a whole new set of modernized processes, essentially turning mines into modern factories uh, with modern machinery and transport and demanding labor discipline. Now, long hours at low pay, uh, rigorous uh, uh, adherence to rules about the time you worked, the amount of labor that you put in. All of this means a radical transformation for people in the workplace, people working in the American mines and people working in factories. Uh, this is becoming far more like the age of the second industrial revolution that had already swept the United States. Now some of that is being brought to Mexico right into Mexican mines and workers are resentful of this radical change of a loss of control that they once had when they did the work in the mines and did it essentially at their own pace and did it with hand tools. Now they are the subject of strict discipline by the American managers and they strongly resent that as well as the biases that are shown towards them. They are paid much less than Americans often for the same kind of work. All of this means there is deep-seated discontent in Mexico among both peasants and workers and as we've seen other groups further up the social economic ladder. So to if we use the macroeconomic measures and say, well, the Mexican economy was growing, it certainly prospered under this system, it was moving forward, thousands of miles of rail line were being built, um, hundreds and thousands of tons of mineral ore were being exported along with hmm, uh, millions of dollars worth of agricultural products, all very true. Uh, and even the oil industry. By the early years of uh, the 20th century, Mexico was developing an oil industry along its east coast. If you look here along this area around Tampico, here, uh, both British and American entrepreneurs were coming in and developing the oil industry for Mexico. So by every standard, well, now we have yet another export product. There is success to be measured here. And yet, groups throughout Mexico were paying a price, particularly the people at the bottom. But even further up, when we look at the middle and upper classes, many of these people, although they were better off, nevertheless felt that ultimately they were going to be overwhelmed by the American presence and by the advantages given to the Americans. The challenge to Diaz comes, not surprisingly, from that same Madero family that saw its economic interests being challenged as a result of the Guggenheim presence. A Madero son rises to challenge Diaz for the presidency in 1910, Francisco Madero. Now, Mexico it had been holding elections on a regular basis ever since Diaz had come to power in 1876, but no one seriously believed that those elections uh, were anything but rigged. Now, a son of a prominent elite family from the northern reaches of Mexico is making a challenge and making a serious challenge. He fully intends to try to replace Porfirio Diaz from office. Of course, Diaz more or less laughs at the challenge and he will see to it that Madero is essentially driven out of the country and he will not win the election. But Madero's challenge triggers a series of events that lead to all-out revolution. This is a little bit like the Palmonts challenging Louis in France because Madero's vision for the future is a relatively conservative one. What he really represents is the concern of the provincial elites that they have been excluded from the political process. What he's really demanding through his candidacy is that the Porfirian regime become more inclusive. He's not really calling for an all-out revolution. Uh, and as we will see, when he does get the chance to be president, he doesn't really want an all-out revolution. What he wants is for the provincial elites, such as his own family, to have a larger say in the political process. Uh, 
But of course, he's doing this at a time when Mexican society is seething with discontents. Whether we talk about workers, peasants, middle class, all the way up through Mexican society, we see these intense streams of unrest flowing through Mexico against both Porfirio Diaz and his regime and his policies and against the Americans who have played such a significant role in this attempt at rapid modernization. So Madero, whether he fully realizes it or not, uh, is setting off the revolutionary process through his challenge to Diaz in 1910. Eventually, in 1911, Diaz will be forced to abandon the presidency and turn it over. Well, he doesn't turn it over directly, he leaves, but Madero will now come into office as president as a result of the rebellion against Diaz uh, stemming from this fraudulent election uh, in 1910. As he sails off to Europe to live in exile, Diaz says, well, Madero has released the tiger from its cage. Now let's see if he can ride him. Meaning this, that Diaz was well aware of the deep-seated unrest within Mexican society and how Madero's challenge had unleashed much of that into the public arena. Now the question was, could Madero control those revolutionary forces? People like Zapata and Pancho Villa were strong supporters of Madero's election bid and of his subsequent rebellion against Diaz that helped drive Diaz from power. But they wanted real radical change within Mexico. They didn't just want, okay, let's have an election now so the elite can have more influence in their government. They wanted real substantive change in the economic and social systems of Mexico. And that's something that Madero was really not prepared to grant them. Madero's time in office, 1911 to 1913, is one of constant conflict and increasing deterioration in his base of support. It is not long before both Villa and Zapata, the rural leaders of rebellion, turn against Madero as well. Increasingly, they come to understand that what Madero wants is really a modified version of the Porfirian system, a system that will be more open to influences from the political elites in the provinces and the states, and one that would take a firmer stand in dealing with foreign business. But this is not a system that is going to be wholly democratic, and Madero would hardly think of shutting off the spigot of American capital flows into Mexico. Yes, he wants the national government to assert greater control, but not to the point where foreign investors would be driven from Mexico or where foreign investors would fail to play a major role in Mexico's economy. So his vision of the future is conservative indeed. It is a modification upon the Porfirian plan. Eventually, with his base of support disintegrating, Madero fell victim to a plot by a, an army general uh, who had been in Diaz's military, and he is assassinated in 1913. With his assassination, the revolution would now erupt all across Mexico. It is now clear that the moderate course to the future has been eliminated and that an army general seeking to pick up the mantle of Porfirio Diaz is trying to establish control in Mexico City. Now these other revolutionary forces that we've talked of will come to the fore and begin contending for power, seeking to capture Mexico City, capture control of the government and in the process begin battling each other over 
what the Mexican Revolution is to mean. One group that emerges in these struggles is known as the Constitutionalists because they are going to write a new constitution for Mexico and ensure in that constitution true change for Mexican society. Its leaders include people like Venustiano Carranza. Carranza was a landowner. He had been a senator in the legislature under Porfirio Diaz. He was a member of the establishment. Uh, he would not be that far from Madero. He certainly had, uh, let us say, I wouldn't call them radical ideas, but less conservative ideas than Madero. But still, he's very much an establishment figure. He realizes the need for change and some substantive change, but he is not nearly as radical as many of the other groups. Uh, among his supporters uh, is Alvaro Obregón. Obregón, the typical figure of the middle class that I talked about, uh, is a part of the constitutionalist movement and indeed will become a key figure in it. The constitutionalists, like Madero, want greater input for the elites and also the middle class in the political system. And they do want to put serious constraints and controls on foreign investment, which they recognize has threatened to overwhelm uh, all classes in society. But they're particularly concerned about the elite and the middle class. So they do have a more dramatic agenda than Madero's. But they are hardly, again, radicals. They do not want to drive out the Americans they simply want to have a greater control over their activities. On the other hand, they face a challenge from groups that include Villa and Zapata. And again, we're simplifying this to a dramatic extent because many people would identify uh, themselves as followers of Zapata or Villa, but they're not really part of the specific movements of Zapata and Villa, and even Zapata and Villa operated in two very different parts of the country. There are a variety of revolutionary groups, uh, but they again help typify uh, the types of groups from the rural areas in particular uh, that are challenging uh, the constitutionalists because they want more radical change. They want protection, for example, for village lands. They want to preserve the institution of the peasant village. They want protection uh, for uh, many of the rural workers uh, who work on the great commercial estates. There is yet another radical group that was on my list, but I haven't uh, discussed it yet, and that was the Casa de Obreros. The Casa de Obreros was a labor organization, particularly centered in Mexico City, and one that was heavily influenced, strongly influenced, by the anarchist tradition. These are industrial workers in Mexico City, uh, working in factories. Uh, others, for example, work in the electric plants that have been created in Mexico City. Uh, there are branches elsewhere, for example, in the uh, oil fields uh, in eastern uh, Mexico but particularly strong in Mexico City itself. The workers of the Casa are pursuing an agenda of their own, which is strongly anarchist in its orientation. They want to eliminate capitalist development in Mexico. They want to assert worker control over the economy so that workers would run the factories. And capitalism would come to an end in Mexico. And they want to create a decentralized society where there would not be a powerful state that could encourage and make possible the exploitations of the past. So here we have a strong anti-capitalist sentiment being expressed by these urban workers. What's important to remember that they too, well, they would fall on the side of radicals, that we could describe them as radicals. This is not a coherent set of groups. We can't take Veer and Zapata and the Casa and other groups and say, well, again, we have this coherent organization. Uh, when we look next time uh, at the uh, Bolsheviks and the Russian Revolution, here you have a revolutionary party uh, with a variety of elements in it, but it's a relatively coherent movement. Here we've got a variety of groups, all challenging the uh, regime in Mexico City. Uh, but even the radicals are not 
part of one coherent single political movement, and as we will see, there are substantive differences. In the time after Madero's assassination, conflict, armed conflict, sweeps through Mexico as these various groups challenge each other. They challenge the uh, regime in Mexico City. The constitutionalists fight against it. The radicals do. The radicals and the constitutionalists challenge each other. So Mexico devolves into a period of acute violence uh, across its territories as these various groups fight each other and try to achieve control uh, of the national government. Now, as these events unfold, the United States is not indifferent to what is happening in Mexico. There is, after all, by this time, more than a billion dollars of U.S. investment in Mexico, and much of it is being damaged by this revolution. Can't help but be, because, of course, if people are tearing up railroad tracks and uh, trying to uh, secure money from foreign corporations to help fuel their revolutionary activities, American interests are going to suffer all of this out of all of this, even if it's only because exports are going to decline, economic activity, whether it's mining or agriculture or oil, is going to be more difficult to pursue. But beyond that, there is, of course, the fact that some of these groups do seem to have very radical ideas. Uh, Zapata was influenced in part by anarchist thinkers as well. Uh, the agenda of radical groups, even though it may not be a single agenda, they may not be operating as a single coherent movement, is a real threat to American interests because some of these groups clearly uh, want to dispense with foreign investment and are even talking about creating a society which would not be a capitalist society. So the United States has profound concerns about what's going on just south of its border in Mexico where it has so much uh, capital invested, where large corporations like the Guggenheim brothers' interests are being threatened, uh, oil interests like Standard Oil of New Jersey, what we know today as Exxon, uh, are at risk because of this revolution, not only for immediate economic damage, but the threat that a radical political group will come to the fore, such as the anarchists, such as the Casa de Obreros, and dramatically alter Mexico's future course and take Mexico away from the path of capitalist development that it was now pursuing. The problem was what to do about it. President Wilson uh, met with a number of his advisors to discuss this situation, and they did consider the possibility uh, of outright military intervention, of sending uh, a U.S. military force down to end the revolution and to, as they would put it, restore order. In other words, put in a regime that would remain favorable to the United States and to its interests. However, uh, U.S. military leaders advised Wilson that the cost of such a project would be enormous that the United States would have to send tens of thousands of soldiers into Mexico, that the cost would run into the millions upon millions of dollars, and that the operation might take years. Because, of course, you've got this vast territory. You've got a variety of different revolutionary groups that are fairly well armed. And if the United States goes down there, there's already this current of anti-Americanism uh, that will further galvanize the revolutionary forces if the United States intervenes directly. So an alternative was found uh, for the purpose of protecting American interests. The U.S. essentially felt that the constitutionalists, well, they too were anxious to control American investment in Mexico and did not want to use the same open-door policy as Diaz had. Nevertheless, the constitutionalists were more uh, groups that they could identify as part of the establishment. People like Carranza had been around a long time. They clearly did not uh, promote the same radical agenda that groups like the CASA did. So the United States decides to throw its lot with these groups. In April of 1914, an incident occurs which leads the United States to uh, carry out a naval bombardment against the main port of Mexico, Veracruz. The United States then landed troops in Veracruz. And while there, the American troops left tons of military equipment and supplies in the city. They then departed the city and left it to be taken over by the Constitutionalists. The Constitutionalists suddenly had a wealth of arms available to them left by the Americans, everything from hand grenades to machine guns to barbed wire, and were able to effectively use these against the more radical groups, particularly Villa, but also Zapata.
Now, there's one other element that plays in here besides American involvement at Veracruz to help arm the Constitutionalists more effectively. And that is that the Constitutionalists are able to make an alliance with the Casa de Obreros, with the radical workers in Mexico City. Now, you might well say, well, that's an odd kind of pairing because the Casa workers, they're on the radical side. In fact, they're probably more radical than most of the people following Zapata Ravia. Why would they align themselves with the more moderate conservative side of the constitutionalists? Much of the answer goes back to the rural-urban split that we talked about that was classic in Mexican history. The urban workers often found it difficult to identify uh, with peasants. When Zapata's forces actually uh, entered Mexico City at one point in the revolution, uh, the workers in Mexico City were exposed to Mex many of their uh, fellow countrymen, peasants who had come to the city, and they saw them as relatively benighted. They were very religious. Uh, most of the workers were secular in their orientation. Uh, the peasants show a great deal of deference to their social betters, something Mexican workers had long since abandoned. Uh, there is a real cultural gap that exists between the urban workers and the peasants. And given certain promises that the constitutionalists were able to make, the workers were willing to uh, throw their lot in with the constitutionalists and form uh, Red Army battalions that help fight against the Viistas in particular so that for a time we find the more conservative forces along with the Casa fighting against the Zapatistas and the Viistas. The Casa workers would come to rue the day they had done this because eventually when the constitutionalists will win they'll turn on the Casa as well and seek to suppress the Casa workers. But for a time this temporary alliance along with the American supply of arms helps the constitutionalists come to power. Now, as much as the Constitutionalists will win and will be able to suppress uh, the radical workers of the Casa in Mexico City, they recognized that they, there had to be real change in Mexico. That to simply to go back to something that was the Porfirian regime or a slightly altered version of it simply would not do that there was no way that Mexico could return to peace and stability unless some of the needs uh, of these various revolutionary groups were met. And as a result, the Constitution that is written in 1917 helps reflect those interests. It is certainly more radical than anything the Constitutionalists would have done on their own. But they recognize that in order to have peace, they have to address some of these other concerns that go beyond what they themselves might have wished for. The 1917 Constitution is both a national and a social constitution. In other words, it asserts, first of all, Mexico's national sovereignty, and in a very specific way, uh, and that is Mexico's right to control its own natural resources. It will put limits on the ability of foreigners to work in and develop Mexico's economy. For example, they are not allowed to buy uh, property in Mexico that is within a certain distance of the borders of Mexico. Uh, so we don't want Americans you know, buying up all this territory right on our borders. We don't want to see the danger of detachment of those territories uh, from our country again. There will be, it will provide the basis for limitations on foreign investment. Foreigners to own only 49 percent of any company they invest in in the future. So it has a real nationalist orientation to it, and one that is focused particularly on the very large role that Americans had come to play in the Mexican economy. It's also a social constitution because it calls for both the protection of the rights of workers and for a restoration of the peasant village. So here is a constitution that is addressing both these nationalistic concerns, which all groups in Mexico shared, but also is addressing some of the real social concerns of workers and peasants. The only downside of this is that the constitution, in order to be truly effective, needs a series of implementing laws, laws that will see to it that indeed uh, these 
very promising uh, objectives of the Constitution are in fact carried out. Unfortunately, much of that did not happen in the early years after 1917. There is some land reform taking place, some expropriation of land from foreign companies and return of land to peasants, but that is limited. As far as workers, there's no national labor code written uh, during the 1920s, for example, to protect workers. Individual states often have labor codes that protect workers to some degree, but the national government does not put in a national labor code. So certainly the ideals are high-minded, but still the revolution has not really fulfilled its promise because many of the objectives of the Constitution are not being fully implemented. Among the limitations of this Constitution are the limitations in terms of attempts to control foreign investment. Rising to power under the Constitutionalists is Alvaro Obregón, that same middle class businessman uh, who had been so opposed to American interests. But Obregón discovers in the 1920s as president of Mexico that Mexico has a huge foreign debt. And in order to avoid international financial collapse, he ultimately has to strike a deal with international bankers, including Thomas Lamont, who is head of the international bankers, who happened to be a senior member of J.P. Morgan and Company. J.P. Morgan, of course, the major American banking institution. So in the end, Obregón has to make a deal which will protect much of American foreign investment in Mexico. Yes, there'll be some controls, but there's not going to be a wholesale elimination of American investment in Mexico. Uh, the Mexican elite is going to compromise, partly out of necessity, partly because they believe that indeed Mexico needs foreign investment to prosper. So there will be controls on American investment, but the more radical vision of sweeping aside American investment and putting Mexico's economy strictly in the hands of Mexicans will not be fulfilled. As a result, we do see a resurgence of American interest in Mexico and American investment. But what also happens in the 1920s is that the anarcho-syndicalists become increasingly popular within Mexico leading labor strike after labor strike, they have a compelling message, which is one, they never implemented, they being the constitutionalists, the government, they never implemented the labor codes. You're only at best partially protected now. And look at what Obregón did. He's essentially guaranteed the existing American investment here in Mexico. What we need is social justice, and we need true Mexican nationalism. So what the anarcho-syndicalists are able to do is present themselves as revolutionary nationalists, that they are the ones who are truly against the domination of Mexico by the Americans and seeking social justice at the same time. This is a message that it's very hard for the constitutionalists to react to because they indeed have compromised with the Americans and they have not fulfilled all of the promises of the Constitution. This problem is further exacerbated for them with the Great Depression, which devastates the Mexican economy in the early 1930s. Out of these problems, a desperate situation in the economy, and the popularity of the anarcho-syndicalists, who have criticized the regime for its failure to effectively deal with American domination and the failure to implement social reform, the regime turns towards a new leader in the person of Lázaro Cárdenas. Cárdenas serves as president from 1934 to 1940. And in some ways, his regime is the second Mexican Revolution, or we could simply call it the fulfillment of the Mexican Revolution, to the extent that significant change comes, it comes with Cardenas, in part because he realizes that the growing unrest in the country, the failure to fulfill the nationalistic promises of the revolution, 
and the failure to fill its social agenda. And those problems exacerbated by the devastating effects of the Great Depression. Cardenas revives land reform. And he focuses land reform on the promotion of what is called the ejido. ejido an ejido is simply a communal village land holding. Land is going to be taken particularly from foreign interests but also from large domestic owners and turned over to villages with the idea that the land will be used to restore village communal activity in the form of these communal land holdings or ejidos. So land reform takes on a new vigor under Cardenas. At the same time, in Mexico, there is mounting unrest among the oil workers of Mexico. The oil workers of Mexico are demanding a dramatic increase in pay, and they are poorly paid, to say the least. But more than that, they want to unionize almost all of the management positions within the oil companies. In other words, they want most of the supervisory personnel to be part of their unions. The oil companies resist the pay raise, but they're even more resistant to this idea of unionizing supervisors because as they themselves point out, what this will mean is that we'll lose control of the company. Because if the managers are unionized, then we have no way of controlling the company. In many ways, the oil workers, who had been long influenced by anarchists, anarcho-syndicalists, were asserting the right of worker control. This is what they were looking for, that the workers would control the oil industry. This conflict reaches an impasse. The Mexican government is brought in, specifically Cardenas, to try to find a solution. Eventually, the oil companies are willing to concede on the pay raise, but not on the unionization of the supervisors. The Supreme Court of Mexico rules in favor of the union. The oil companies defy that ruling. And at that point in 1938, in March of 1938, Cardenas nationalizes the oil industry. It is the most historically memorable event of Mexico's 20th century economic history. It is the ultimate assertion of Mexican nationalism, taking control of the oil industry, defying huge American corporations. But in the end, Cardenas does not plan on pursuing the most radical goals of the revolution. And his nationalization of the oil industry makes it clear that that's the case. Because when he nationalizes the oil industry, Cardenas does not give the workers control of the industry. They're going to get a raise, but the oil industry will now be run by a national corporation, a government-owned corporation. And the workers will still be the workers. It'll be essentially a form of state capitalism. Cardenas, with all his reforms and changes, land reform and nationalization of the oil industry, was not willing to go to the length of creating a system of worker control. And indeed, later when mine and electrical workers try the same thing, strike for worker control, he absolutely insists that he will not allow that. In fact, he points to himself as the first patriot of Mexico because he's the one that nationalized the oil industry and says that the workers who are trying to defy him now in mining and electricity are anti-revolutionaries. They're counter-revolutionaries. So he uses his prestige as a great nationalist to see to it that this system of worker control will never take place. Instead, Mexico will form or pursue a system of state capitalism uh, in conjunction with foreign corporations. Out of these activities emerges the national political party, the PRI, the Institutionalized Revolutionary Party, which rules Mexico down to the present day and still pursues these same policies. So we see that the revolution does make some dramatic changes in Mexico, asserting its nationalism, land reform, rights for workers. But nevertheless, it falls short of the more radical ambitions expressed, particularly peop like people in the Casa de Obreros and the oil workers later on. Those more radical visions would not be fulfilled by the revolution. Summing all of this up, what can we say are the basic causes of the revolution? Certainly one of the basic causes is part of Mexico's colonial legacy. 
that Mexico was characterized by labor exploitation, systems like debt peonage, and acute economic underdevelopment. As of the beginning of the 19th century, those conditions continued to prevail and would continue to prevail through most of the 19th century, that the labor of peasants and workers would be exploited to the maximum and wealth would accrue to the upper reaches of society, but economic development would not be achieved and neither would social and economic equality. Typical of that was the conflict between the great estate, or hacienda, and the village. This continuing encroachment of the great estate upon the village and a process which was accelerated dramatically by Porfirio Diaz when he becomes president in the name of development. So what was a continuing conflictual relationship between large landowners and peasants now becomes a matter of social war as Diaz pursues this process of rapid modernization. In essence, it is this system that we can call liberal developmentalism, meaning how do we develop our economy? Well, Diaz, the classic liberal, has the answer, we open the economy up completely to free market forces. That is what will bring about rapid development. And of course, in Diaz's vision, there is an important role to be played by Americans. They have the capital and technology. Yet, Americans already have a questionable relationship with Mexico, having deprived Mexico of so much of its territory, and now they're going to come in and play a central role in its economic development. As a result, the Americans will become as much a focus of revolutionary forces as the central government itself. Americans will be seen as critical in creating a process which many people in Mexico, particularly workers and peasants, see as highly exploitative. And even among elites and middle class, the Americans will be seen as a threat to their economic prosperity because Diaz is so liberal in opening up opportunities for the Americans as compared to domestic elites and the middle class. And finally, there is the influence of the anarchist tradition, one that we can trace back almost to the middle of the 19th century in Mexico and one which has heavy influence in the Casa de Obreros and among oil workers in particular, but also mine workers and electrical workers. This is what gives the revolution a truly radical tinge, this vision of a world in which workers will control the economy and create a more equitable and just society. What about goals of the revolution? Well, here we can really spell out some very different possibilities. As far as the elite, if we talk about people like Madero, for that matter, Carranza, who later led the revolution, the elite is concerned with political power, meaning they are representative of the provincial elites who have been excluded for so long from power in Mexico City under Diaz. They want participation. Not democracy, but participation. Nationalism. They too are concerned about the increasing power of the Americans and their role in the economy and the danger they will dominate Mexico. Yet, unlike other groups, they see the need for foreign assistance in development. They want to control the Americans, but they don't want to get rid of them. The peasantry. Peasants are looking for land to reverse the process by which they have been losing land and their way of life to the greatest states, whether they're, they're Mexican controlled or American controlled. And also popular nationalism. They are among the leading forces in fighting for a sovereign Mexican state, which will fend off the domination of the United States, whether it's economic or political. And as for workers, they are seeking a form of socialism, a form of control by workers uh, that they see rooted in their own anarchist traditions, a more equitable and just society at the very least. And they too are ardent, ardent advocates of popular nationalism. Now that's not to say that either of these groups dismiss the idea of development, but their ideas of development would be development controlled by Mexicans and development which would have a truly equitable distribution of wealth and power within Mexican society. Now, with those causes and goals, what are the ultimate outcomes? As much as 
the more radical agenda may have been frustrated. The truth is that peasants and workers do achieve some goals. Peasants receive land. Carranza does guarantee at least certain rights of workers, perhaps not the more radical goal of worker control, but certainly better wages, a better relationship in terms of their negotiating stance with foreign as well as domestic corporations. The government does have a social agenda by the time of Carranza. Popular participation, meaning popular political participation, becomes a reality in Mexico. A political system in which indeed, while there may be social inequalities, all Mexicans have some role in the political process. And popular nationalism, an assertion of Mexico's sovereignty, of its right to control its own territory, its own economy, its own destiny. Economic nationalism, very much a part of that same process, that Mexicans will ultimately have the final say in the control of their economic system. Furthermore, the state is to take on new responsibilities. We indeed do have a centralizing state here, one that's going to play a larger role in the economy, nationalizing the oil industry, but also is going to take on responsibilities in the social sphere to protect workers, to provide some participation for workers and peasants in their society, land for peasants, for example. It's not an ideal system, but one in which the state is far more active in the protection of social rights than it ever had been before. But it is also true that ultimately, the PRI, which emerges as the national political party, will still continue to dominate Mexican society from above and still push developmentalism above social and economic justice. So the ultimate goal from the position of the elite is economic development, whereas the ultimate goal for the peasants and workers was social and economic justice. This is the mixed heritage of the Mexican Revolution at the end of the 20th century.